All right, so let's discuss uh, this equality. What we want to do here is to, first of all, understand what it says, and then try to see if we can prove the equality. Um, the equality is in terms of two sets, A and B, and um, there are no assumptions on these sets except that they are not empty, because if they are empty, that intersection A and intersection B wouldn't be defined, right? So A and B are not into sets. Um, we just had a, a brief chat and came to the conclusion that um, unpacking what this equality means is already a big challenge, a big task. Um, I suppose the left hand side is a bit more straightforward than the right hand side and therefore let's first look at the left hand side or maybe we should start off by writing out the definitions we're going to use in unpacking the equality so what are we going to need to know in order to understand this equality? So we, we, we will need to know what it means to have an intersection of x, right? For a set x. And well, that is the set of all, um, which letter shall we use there? Y's, such that there exists an x and x, such that y, no, actually such that for every x and x, right? Y in the end of X. This definition only works when X is not empty set. So that's one concept we need. Another concept we need is the concept of difference of two sets. X minus Y is the set of all X's in X such that um, X is not an element of Y. And then we need um, the definition for union and intersection written in this way. So union of, of certain things, right? What is this? How do we read this before we unpack it? How do we read this? So, this is union of these things which are parameterized by B. Every B in B gives rise to a certain thing here and is the union of these things. So the general concept I need to have to unpack that would be a concept of union of X's where each X is designed out of a certain B, right? So maybe I'm going to put the B in the subscript. Mm -hmm. So for each B, imagine I've got an XB, and now we want to take the union of that. Now this is the same as the union of the set of all of XBs. So this is how this notation gets transformed into that notation. And now to unpack this further, we will have to know what is union of a set, let's say Y. In this case, Y would be the set. And union of Y is the set of all those Zs such that there exists a Y in Y whose element is Z. And then the final ingredient is the parameterized intersection. So intersection of, um, let's call these things Y A's now. Again, switching from this notation to the unary intersection notation. So it's the intersection of all the Y A such that A is an A. 
So that's how we switch from here to there. And intersection of some set, x, we already have written in outlet means. So these are all the ingredients we're going to need to understand what each of the sides of this equality says. Do you have any questions so far? Any questions on these ingredients? Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Great. Now let's see how they combine to give um, the left hand side and the right hand side. So there are two ways we could approach this. One would be to straight away use these definitions and compute the left hand side to its simplest form, then compute the right hand side to its simplest form and then compare those things if you want to establish equality. Another way would be to pick an element in the left hand side and analyze what it means for something to be an element of this. So we could do either computation or by analysis. Which one do you like more? Computation or analysis? Analysis. Analysis. Okay. Um, we can try to do both as well. Maybe that will be more illustrative and less dependent on the taste of the listener. Okay, so um, x being an element. Okay, so, so let's also choose our variables carefully. We've got lots of x's in these definitions, right? So maybe we don't want to use x here not to get confused with these x's and those x's. So let's use a new variable instead of x. What shall this be? x is taken, y is taken, z is taken, b is taken, a is taken, everything is taken. Uh, maybe c. Uh, what it means for C to be an element of of this? Now, how do we switch from computation to analysis? Because this, these formulas are not analytical, right? They're computational, right? They, they give computation of what it is in terms of a set. Huh? Uh, Obviously, I, I'm pointing to this because this is what we want to apply, since this is the difference of two sets, right? So, so now I think of this as x and that as y, and I could just do the substitution. I could say, okay, in general, what, what would it mean for x to be an element of x minus y? So first, okay, transform both. this into an analytical expression. They're both x's, because it's intersection of both. Where is the intersection of two things? Um, it's the intersection of A yeah. and intersection of B. Right. So what do you mean between the X so and So X is y? intersection of A yes. and Y is intersection of B. Okay, you're not comparing it to that side. The union part. No, sorry. Not yet. The, the okay. outer operation here is oh, okay, sorry. the difference. Yes, okay, okay. So that's an important remark that we want to think of this as uh, x minus y because that's the outermost thing when we analyze we want the outermost thing to break it down further so this is an element of x minus y and what does that mean well we've got the computation of x minus y here now how do I switch from computation to analysis well by using by reading the what is written out in terms of getting the intuition of what's happening, right? Or I could also do symbolic manipulations, but, but it's going to be uh, very uh, non-insightful, non and I might make mistakes. So what this says is that we are picking out all the elements of the first set, but not all of them, only those that are not elements of the second set. <coughs> yeah? So being an element of the difference, means being an element of the first one and at the same time not being an element of the second one. So now we've switched from computational um, expression into an analytical one. I wonder if these terms exist, computational and analytical expressions. I think I've, I've invented it right now. Okay. 
So, for whoever is watching the video, to, for a disclaimer not to conclude that these are familiar terms. Okay, so, um, do you understand the switch? Do you have any questions about it? Great. Um, but now we want to apply this in this case, right? But now that we've got it in this form, application is straightforward. We just substitute x, a, intersection A in the place of x and intersection B in the place of y. So now we get that, um, so because of this, we get that C being an element of intersection A minus intersection B is equivalent to C being an element of intersection A and C not being an element of intersection B. Okay, so let's leave it here for now. Let's not go further than that. Let's leave it at this point. So being an element of the left hand side of the equality means means that. Okay? Now what about the right hand side? What would make C an element of the union? of the intersection. Um, well, again, we could apply the same procedure. We go to the computation of union. There it is. And then we will have to do it in two steps, in fact. One is transforming this into that, and the other is then applying this to that, right? <coughs> so, we could write this as by, by applying this formula we could rewrite this as um, union of who are the XB's? These ones, right? where um, B is an element of B. And now, by the definition of union, the elements of the union are those Zs that fall in one of the elements of, of the Y, right? So being an element of this union is equivalent for C for C to be an element of one of the elements of this set. You see how I'm, I'm transforming the computation into analytical by through intuition. I'm telling myself, okay, what does this stand for? This is the set of those sets that is an element of one of the elements of Y. So the essential quantifier is gone. I replace it with the phrase one of, okay? You see, y y yes. So, when we say the union of, and that's it, that's it, is represented by capital Y. Right. Okay. The capital Y now is this set. Okay. And now I want elements of this, right? Mm -hmm. Elements of union Y are those things, those things, that is an element of one of the elements of Y. Right? I, I, it might be necessary for me to repeat this several times to myself before I switch to the concrete case. So let's do it again. So elements of the union Y are those things that are elements of one of the elements of Y. Okay. So we've got Y. We take one of its elements and their elements are, are going to be in the union. So if something is in the union, it means it's an element of one of the elements of Y. Does this make sense? So we, we kind of turned the visual uh, information into audio information, if you like. Okay? Now we are going to use that and apply here and turn it into a visual one, but in a different form. Uh, so now we want C to be an element of one of the elements of this thing. Now what are elements of this thing? These ones, right? 
So C is an element of one of these ones. So was that too fast? <laughs> Let's go back here. No, I just I like I understand that. Like I understand if something is an element of the union of Y, then it's the element of something. So it's a small Y that's the element of big Y, which is cool, and that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But now we're saying C is an element of that union. Fine. Now, C is then Y. This is Y, right? Yes, that, that's Y. Yeah. Now, C is an element of one of the small Y's, right? Yeah. So, so what is a small Y? It's an element of big Y. Yes. Right? So C must be an element of one of the elements of this set. Yes. Okay, what are elements of this set? These things, right? Oh. Okay, yes. Yeah. So, so this shows us the sh shape of elements and this gives us the condition that they, that this should satisfy. So C is an element of one of these ones. Because that's how the elements of Y look like. But now this is not just a random thing. It, it is such that B comes from B. And it's one of those. So, so because this depends on B, then being one of those means that we are picking one B. So we are saying that there exists a B. Such that we've got this. Does this make sense? Now, if you, if you want to see direct kind of link between this expression from the visual side and that expression from the visual side, well, that's an interesting question. Let's look at if there is any link. I mean, I have no idea. Because for me, the, I haven't been relating the visual side of this with the visual side of that at all. I haven't been doing that. I'm going through my intuition. Where for me, all this says is that in the union we've got things that are elements <coughs> of the given set. And so, this is now the given set. And we want things that are elements. Did I say elements of the given set? You said elements of the given set. No, I was wrong. <laughs> uh, so, what we've got here are things that are elements of elements yeah. of the given set. Yeah. So, so something to be an element of this, it must be an element of an element of this. Yeah. So isn't that yeah. formula And wrong? this is how element of this looks like. What? What? This, this is how the element, oh, okay. an element yes. of this set looks like. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Yeah? Yes. But, but what, I mean, what is the, where does this come from itself? It comes from a B, right? For, for this to be an element of that set, it's not sufficient that it looks like this. It should have the B being an element of B. So that's why we say there is a B, instead of saying there is such a thing. Because there being such a thing, since such a thing always comes out of any B that's in B, it reduces to there being a B. Yes? Now, my question is, when we say C is an element of the union and that, when we say, for example, C is an element of the union of the capital Y equals Z, etc., 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 when we write that out, we don't say that C is an element of Z. We do. No, we don't. Sorry, you're right, we don't. The C plays the role of Z. Yeah, so why are we now saying that C is an element of the first part of the No, because, because you, you're making the analogy on the wrong spot here. So this 
is not y. This is the union y. So this is not that. Okay. This is not z. Z is an a representation of an element of the union of this thing. So in fact, z is the c. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So what we've done now is we look, we expanded one step, the left hand side and right hand side. So the left hand side in one step expansion gives this, and the right hand side in one step expansion gives this. But we did we did this through uh, analysis. Now let's see how we could do this through computation. Um, so another approach. This this was one approach to arrive to this. Sorry. Yes. Are those two boxes the same? No, one is bigger than the other. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the same. So this box represents C being an element of, of this. Yeah. And the other box represents C being an element of the other one. Okay. So they come they, they represent C being an element of this one or the other one. Is that sufficient so to show that they equal? No, it's not. No. No, we're, we're still not there. Uh, a few more hours left. <laughs> okay. Yeah? That's fine. We thought that you were saying that that is the proof. No, not at all. No. Oh, that's why you asked me the yeah. same. Okay, no, no, that's a good question. No, not yet. Um, so, what would be... How, how can we get the same thing by computation? Well, we can call it algebra if we're calling the other one analysis. Um, so, equals, and this is where we're going to do substitutions, right? So, we now going to, but remember we didn't break it down further into section A and into section B in this step. We, we kept it. So, we now have to apply this formula to that. So, we just substitute into section A and section B in the place of X and Y respectively. So, we're going to get all the X's in intersection A such that X is not in intersection B. And then we stop there because we stopped, that's where we stopped here. Good, now uh, the other one, the other side. We want to now apply first this formula and then that formula. So we'll, we'll do step by step. So first we're going to apply this formula. We're going to have a union bracket. What do we have in the place of xb? Well, whatever is there, right? Mm -hmm. And so that thing, xb now, is that whole thing. Yeah. So that's going to go in there. Such that, and then we're going we're to put b's in b, and the b's are the same as, as in the spe special case, so they're not changed, so they just remain like that. Yeah. Good. But now we, we want to expand this further by applying the definition of union, which is this. So we would have to take, take this formula and whatever y we've got here, put that y in here. So I'm going to copy paste this and then replace the y with, with that thing. So it's the set of those sets such that there exists a y in that thing, that set. Such that z is an element of y. We could stop here, or we could make one more step by analyzing what it means for y to be an element of this. Um, this is the set of all these things, right? Now, for there to exist a y, 
there's an element of this means for there to exist a y that's of this form. Right? But how can there be, exist a y that's of this form? By there existing a b. And then we can get rid of the y because if y is of this form, then we can directly put this form into there. So we could say there exists a b in b such that z is an element of y, but now the y is this. So I cheated a bit here, I did a little bit of analysis still. Could you just quickly re explain what you said? Um, so, there is an intermediate step there saying that there exists a, a y, and now I want to say what it means to be an element of this, such that um, there exists a b in b, such that y is equal to the intersection a minus b and z being an element of y. Um, in fact, there is another intermediate step. So, to say that there is a y in there such that this it is, is the same as to say that there is a y such that two things happen. On one hand, y is in that set, right? And on the other hand, z is an element of y. Do you agree with that? To say that there is a y in this set such that z is in y is to say there is a y such that y is in there and z is in y. So that's what I've written here. There is a y such that y is in there and z is in y. But now, if I look at this part, y being in there, it means that y is one of these, right? So for y to be in here, it means that there exists a b such that y is that. Yeah? But now if there is a b such that y is that and z is in y, then who is y? I mean, y is going to be uniquely determined by this thing. So I can get rid of the exists y part and just leave it with there exists a b. Yeah. Yeah? I understand, but... but it it takes a lot of thinking. It does, yes. It, it takes, it takes uh, definitely it takes thinking and um, in a way we kind of shortcut this because we've kind of implemented all these steps in the intuition mm -hmm. and we switched from there to there. Yeah. But the algebraic si sign reveals more what the, that there were actually missing steps in the way. I mean, in general, that, that, that's what algebra does. It, it reveals to you um, details of logical arguments which you might have missed if you were arguing in a geometric way. Okay, so now we arrive to the left hand side equal to this and the left hand side equal to that, so that's for number one and for number two, the left hand side being equal to that and if I compare these with the ones we've got here what does it mean for C to be an element of this? It means for C to be one of these axes, right? So it's exactly this. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean for C to be an element of this? It means that C is one of the Zs. And you see it's exactly this. So if I replace Z with C, I get exactly that. C being in this set, so this is the set of all Z's satisfying that. So, yeah. so, you see, the algebraic argument has longer expressions and, and, and it's a bit more complicated because we now have to use some non-trivial steps. Whereas this argument is, is more intuitive. But if you want to have a full understanding, then the best thing to do is to do both. Whichever feels easier at first, do that one first, and then do the other one, and then compare the results. And then if they match, it means you've understood everything. Okay, so let's go further now. Do you have any questions so far?
Uh, let's analyze them further. So C being an element of intersection of A and C not being an element of intersection of B. What is that equivalent to? Maybe I'm going to write it on this side. Well, being in the intersection of A means being in every element of A, right? So for every A in A, C is an element of A. And the other one is that for every B in B, C is an element of B. Yeah? Does, does everyone agree with that? So this part breaks down to this part, and this part breaks down to this part. No, of course not. It's, it's nonsense. I made a mistake. Sorry. We want to say this is not true, right? We want to say it's not true that for every B in B, C is in B. Because C should not be an element of intersection B. Okay, so let's go further. So I don't think we can break this down further. So we just have for every A in A, C is in A. And, but this could be simplified further. What does it mean for there not to be true that for every B something is true? It means for there exists and for there to exist a B for which this is not true. Yeah. So, this is the same as saying there exists a B in B such that C is not in B. <coughs> yeah? So that's one. Now, I mean this is we can't go further than that. This is where we stop because now everything has been expanded in terms of the element relationship. And that's the, the, the lowest level we can go. Do you play Minecraft? <laughs> you, you know, when you go to the bedrock, you cannot go further down unless there is a bug in the software. Sometimes there's a hole and you can see the sky. Okay. Uh, so um, now let's try to do the second one. Um, for there to exist a B in B such that C is an element of intersection of A minus B so what is that equivalent to? well we can break this further down, right? what it means for C to be in an intersection so we're saying that it exists a B in B such that C is in each of these, right? Again, I'm doing this skipping the algebraic steps now. Mm -hmm. Intersection of things. It's it's all the things that all the elements that are in every of these, right? Yeah. So that for every of these, but these are parameterized by A, right? Mm -hmm. So for each A we have one of these. So to say for every this, we have to say for every A. For every A in A, C must be an element of A minus B. And we can break this further down. This means C is an element of A, and C is not an element of B. And we can't go further than this because now everything has been spelled out in terms of the element relationship. Now comparing 1 and 2, what we see is that they kind of have the same ingredients, but these ingredients are arranged in different ways. We've got a universal quantifier on its own there and the existential on its own. Here, the existential has been moved out, universal has been moved in, and these two have come together. Now, do these two things logically mean the same thing? Right. Um, I kind of don't think it's easy to, to see that just like that. 
we will have to try to assume the first and conclude the other one and also go backwards. Is it, is it wrong to say that, that there exists a B and B uh, in the second one? Has almost less value, less importance in a way? Because it doesn't really influence much of, of what follows. Or do I, do I misunderstand? Now, this kind of approach to mathematics is similar for a surgeon to say, hmm, this, this vein, where does it even go? Maybe we can cut it off. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't have enough value. <laughs> so, we could use such, uh, such approach, and kind of coming up with an idea how to prove that things, but not as an argument, not as a logical argument. Do yeah. you have a question? Can you make a like a logical argument that when you say that you have a, a, a exponential quantifier mm -hmm. there exists B and N with a B and the existential quantifier that follows it where A is an element of A they not linked via any they don't have the same variables so you don't have a small B where you have for all A in A, you don't have a B. Right. So, and the same goes for there exists a B in B. You don't have right. an A. Right. So right. they don't affect each other. Right. Right. Therefore. So, so, so what you're doing, now, you, you're a genius, okay? So what you're doing now, you're discovering uh, one of the deduction rules for quantifiers. Not deduction rules for quantifiers, one of the rules that allows to interconnect to quantifiers and separate them. Yeah. Yeah. Ex absolutely, yeah. But you will see, you will see now that there will be a little bit of intricacy here. The separation, if I, if I can see this right now, will actually depend on the fact that neither of the sets were empty. It turns out that if one of them is empty, this is no longer equivalent to that. Let's actually look, at, look into that. So what happens when A is empty, for instance. This is always going to be true, right? For everything in empty set, whatever I state, it's true because there's nothing in empty set. Yeah. So when A is empty set, this will be saying there is a B, right? Such that C is not in B. Mm -hmm. Now when A is empty set here, um, sorry, when capital A is empty set here, this will automatically be true, right? So this will be saying there is a B in B, full stop. So this will be saying there is a B in B, this will be saying there is a B in B such that C is an element of B. So this will be saying more. Look, when A is empty set, it's trivially true that for every A in A this whole thing holds. Oh, okay. I, see. Yeah. I mean, your remark is still valid, this does not depend on A, but this expression doesn't know, it thinks it does because it, fall, it was inserted in a place where we first quantified with A. So it this kind of behaves like it depends on A. And then, with, when A is the empty set, this is always true. So this whole thing just says there exists a B and B. Whereas here, because they have been separated, this says more. It says there is a B and B such that C is not in B. So the two things are not equivalent in that for, for the case when A is the empty set. Okay. But A is not the empty set. We, we said it from the start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to now, to see now how they are equivalent, we would want to conclude one from, the, from each other. And this we would do using the, the familiar schemes we've been using in, in a different part of the course. So uh, we're going to assume the left hand side, uh, I, mean, I mean the top, and deduce the bottom and the other way around. So, so let's try to do that. So let's assume for every A in A, C is in A, and there exists a B in B, such that C is not, not in B. And let's try to conclude from there that there exists a B in B, such that for every A in A, C is in A, and C is not in B. Okay? So to prove there exists a B, we need to uh, define a B, right? We have to say B equals something. And then for that B, we have to prove that for every A in A, C is in A, and C is not in B. 
Yeah, you agree with that? So now the question is, how, where do we produce the B from, right? Well, this one says there is a B. This one says this and that, right? So we know there is such a B. So from this we can actually conclude that C isn't an element of B for a certain B, the one that comes from here. Yeah. And maybe I would want to distinguish between this B and that B, so I'm going to put it B prime here. And then I'm going to call this B the B prime. I'm going to take the B I want to exist, I'm going to take it to be the same B as the B prime I know exists from the top line. So do you say that that's an element of the big B as well? Then C wouldn't be an element of, of capital B, uh, of small b. Uh, uh, sorry, you're right. So I should have added here that uh, this B prime is an element of capital B. So then we have this, and B is an element of that. And now we want to prove that for every A, C is in A and C is not in B. So we take any A, and we take any A in A, and um, we try to show that C is in A, and C is not in B. Well, this part we already have from there, so we just need to show that C is in A. But that comes from this fact. We can apply this now to this specific A to conclude that C is in A. So we're done with one direction. And here we didn't use the fact that A was non-empty because even in the empty case we, we saw that this is a stronger statement than the other one. But now for the reverse direction we would have to use that fact. So now let's suppose that for every B in B, I mean, sorry, there, there exists a B in B such that for every A in A, C is in A, and C is not in B. From this, we want to prove that for every A in A, C is in A, and separately, we want to prove there exists a B in B such that C is not in B. Okay? So we, we need to prove two statements separately, because there's a conjunction, right? So let's first begin with the first one. We're going to take A in A, <coughs> and now we're going to uh, see if we can conclude that C is going to be element of A. Well, if I take A in A, right, I know there is a B, right? So I can take out that B that I know that exists because of, of this expression, and then for that B, I know that for every A, this will hold, right? And in particular, then, this will hold. So this long thing will hold, and in particular, that implies this. And we're done with this part. Now, the other part, we now want to prove there exists a B. We'll take the one that exists from here. So first we'll have to produce that one, so let's call it B prime. So we know there is a B prime in B, such that uh, for every A in A, C is in A, and C is not an element of B, right? And now we're going to pick that B to be B prime. What do we want to show for that B? We want to show that B is in B, and at the same time, C is not an element of B. Uh, I realized just now that here, when we pick this B to be B prime, we wanted to show not only this, but also that uh, B was an element of B, because we want to have a B in B, right? But we, we had this from, from that line. Okay, sorry about that. Coming back here, So, um, that's what we want now. We want B to be in B and C not to be in B. Well, so I want to, to apply this now. But I can only apply this if I've got an A. I need an A to apply this. Because I need to apply this to some A. 
So how do I know I have an A? Because A is not empty. We assume A is not empty. So then I know there is a certain A. And that once I insert this line, now I know that for this A I could apply this rule. And applying this rule for that A, I'm going to get C element of A and C not an element of B. And out of this, I only need the second part. Where do I get B and B from? Well, I had B equal B prime and B prime being in B. It's a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> on, 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 on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you settle this question? Like, let me go B. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great right, news. <laughs> so I never was in there. No, look, this is, this is our goal. I mean, this is the final thing. So if, if you're fluent in this, it means you're, you're completely fluent in this third work. So, so that's the kind of... And you've got several problems like this to practice on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to summarize, in terms of steps, so what, 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 what did we do? We had a first step where we wrote out all the definitions that, was, that we need, right? Now this step, after some practice, can be skipped. We will have it in our mind. In the beginning, it's not a good idea to skip it, but afterwards we can skip this step. Then the second step was to apply the definitions to analyze what it means for uh, some, something to be an element of the left-hand side and something to be an element of the right-hand side. Right? Um, how quickly we can do this depends on how well we are skilled with working with these things. So the, the more we work, the, the quicker we will become at this. And this would lead us to something like that where we've got a logical statement, another logical statement, and now the third step is to show that these two logical statements are the same. That's when we forget about set theory, now it becomes pure logic, and then we can apply the calculus you learned from the first term, not the analysis calculus, the logic calculus, to, uh, to get convinced that they are equivalent to each other. Because this could be complex statements, it might not be intuitively easy to see that this must be the same as that. But ideally, we'd want to bring it down to to express everything as an element of something. Yeah. So that we can do the logic. Right. Right. That's really cool because, like, in the beginning, we like learn something is an element of something, and now we can yeah. build on that. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah.